If there was ever a time for a needed reset of our national thinking, a time for a refocusing of our pulpits, a reacquaintance with truth and history, and fundamental re-embracing of a biblical worldview, it's today. Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohn. I'm going to be joined in this program again by Pastor Isaac Crockett as we begin a new series of programs that we're calling 10 Principles to National Renewal. Today's program will be part one of a two-part program focusing on the first essential principle, of, in, and that is integrity. Now, as you look around our nation and this world, do you not wonder what in the world is happening? Do you wonder how law and justice can be so quickly distorted or how truth can be so quickly trampled? Do you wonder how those things considered a generation ago as evil and immoral can now be promoted from the highest positions of civil and church leadership? Do you wonder if there's a reason for this and a remedy to it? Well, if you answered yes to one or all of most questions, you're not alone. But are we without direction? Are we without a roadmap for renewal? The answer is no. There is hope. And there is a way, but not without God's help and following His plan. Now, over the next weeks, it's our intent to share God's plan for a blessed nation and the foundational principles identified in scriptures and officially adopted by our nation's founders. These are God's principles, non-negotiable and unable to be improved upon. They're essential for freedom and God's blessing on our nation or, frankly, any nation. We are renewed by them to our blessing, or we continue to reject them to our demise. Now, the first bedrock principle is, as I mentioned, integrity. Integrity itself sits on three foundations, which we'll identify in this program and in part two next week. Most American citizens today have no idea of how our counterparts in the days of the American Revolution believed, thought, and acted. In the early 18th century, most citizens understood the nature of God and honored His expectations for nations, fully embracing them. We, in the 21st century, still enjoy many of the fruits and the rewards of their faithfulness, diligence, hard work, and fervent prayers. But these benefits are quickly slipping. You know, in part two, it's because we don't understand how they came about and in part because we don't know where they came from or, most importantly, know or fear the one from whom they came. For generations, we in America have ignored God's principles. We've not taught them to our children and by our disobedience encouraged government to actually become their God. Silent pulpits have contributed by refusing to teach the whole counsel of God. But if, like Gideon's 300, a year, a long time ago, a dedicated core of spiritual warriors from the community, and we did it now, community to community, from pulpit to pulpit, and from position of elected office to another, if we were all to stand in the gap, identifying, understanding, embracing, and obediently building integrity back into the pillars of society, we can begin and grow once again. And what a magnificent change would occur. And with that introduction, let me welcome and talk right now to Isaac. Isaac, it's great to be with you today. No, no guest. We are the guest. You are the guest. We are the guest. <laughs> but we're talking about something of great importance. Uh, and we're going down this road because people across America, good people, know something's up. Mm -hmm. But most are saying, is there any hope? Is there any direction? We say, yeah, there's a direction. We're going to take and lay down something that hopefully will be important. Uh, integrity is where we're going to go today is the first principle. And like we do often, we want to define it. So if you could define integrity and maybe illustrate it a little bit if you don't mind. Well, you know, Sam, you, you've talked about this recently on our radio program as well, and you went to a passage in the Old Testament, Psalm 25, and the word integrity comes up, in, at least in the King James Version and similar versions, in the Old Testament a lot of times. Um, and so in that, you know, you have David is pleading with the Lord in Psalm 25, almost like God is his judge and he's standing before him. And the, the Old Testament words that we translate as integrity and upright or uprightness, they give this idea of complete innocence. So he's trying to say, I'm innocent. He's unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul? Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. And he goes on, he says, don't let my enemies triumph over me. Don't let anyone trusting in you be trampled over. 
Um, and he says, teach me your ways, show me your ways, lead me in your paths, lead me in an upright way. And then at the end, almost the very end of his, this song that he's written, this poetry, he says, let integrity and uprightness preserve me. I wait on these. So he says, this, this is my preserving. This is what's going to save me. And that's in the Old Testament. And, and then in, in the New Testament, you see almost every writer in the New Testament uses this word of conscience. Uh, I want to have a conscience, you know, that avoids offense to God and man. Um, so it, it is a very biblical concept, um, this idea, but it, it, um, we have to understand <laughs> what the basis is for it. So maybe, maybe you want to talk, and I think that's what we're getting into on this program, is what is that basis for integrity? Well, you know, I, I think Isaac, um, just as we go into it a little bit, I, a verse that you referenced in the, you didn't reference that we referred to the New Testament. Integrity is from the Latin word integer. It mm. means whole or complete. And that's what you're describing. David says vertical relationship to God and uprightness and integrity and then uprightness, which really means, uh, it's actually used in the book of Job, uh, referring to Job. He shot, for, he was a straight shooter. It's a character term. Mm. And it was direct, but you know what? Uh, I think Philippians 4, 8, the Apostle mm -hmm. Paul talks to the, the, the Philippian church and he, and he puts it this way, he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, he lays out the way we should think. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just leave our listeners with this, our viewers right now with this thought, when you, ladies and gentlemen, have integrity, a person of integrity, you are a person of character, but you are complete when that vertical relationship with God is right, your heart, as David said, and that starts with how we think and how we think in our heart, but then it's how we act. So the way we act comes from the way we think, starts with God vertically, extends horizontally, and that, in effect, is the matter of integrity, but you can't start a nation or you can't have an, a family or in any regard without having that foundation. And so that's where we're going to start first in this program. We'll be back in just a moment. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping, this is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And Sam and I are talking today about the first of 10 foundational principles to, to have a blessed nation. And, you know, very, very beginning of the book of Psalms, it talks about a blessed man and what he does do and what he doesn't do, who he hangs around and he's, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And Sam, throughout the book of Psalms, it's, it's a hymnal, it's poetry, but it's very personal things, very devotional. And that's what I think why so many people are drawn of all the Old Testament books. I think more of us have pages and Psalms worn out from our thumbs turning there because they mean so much to us in a personal way. And, and so we were talking about integrity as this first step in having a blessed nation, having a blessed family, church, whatever. There has to be integrity. And, and you said that integrity, it's not just an understanding. It comes from God. There's this God to man aspect of it, vertical aspect. But you said it has to be then lived out, just like Jesus showed us how to live. Um, and you said that, that it has to be the foundation of what we do. So that brings us to a passage in the Psalms, Psalm 121, uh, right from um, uh, the very beginning. It talks about, you know, looking to the Lord. Uh, for, for what we need. But uh, David actually says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city. The watchman you know, gets up to, to look out in vain because if you're not trusting in the Lord, um, that's foundational. Why, 
when we look at our history, the foundation, the founding of America, our founding fathers we sometimes talk about, um, why did they think this was necessary and to what extent, what impact did it, this have on our early national founders? Well, Isaac, you know, it's, uh, we could spend a long time on that. The history is just uh, so amazing when you begin to talk about um, um, those who came before and laid down the foundations of America before it was America. And, you know, when I think that, I think back of a couple of entities. There were, uh, where we are in this nation did not occur overnight. Mm. It was the process of many people in their time laying down a common foundation. We're talking about foundational principles. But they understood these things. And again, we talk about from a biblical worldview, everything we're talking about. And our founders understood, and I'll explain just a few of them right now, um, fully understood it as a biblical view mm -hmm. of the world. So when we talk about a biblical worldview today, we're talking about not something new, but it's the way God always wanted people uh, to, to live. And I think of the, I think of the pilgrims, uh, Isaac, as one example. Uh, the pilgrims landed in 1620. A lot of people don't know that, but the, but the pilgrims came from Holland, <clears throat> excuse me, and they, they, they came here for two reasons. One, they came as missionaries, hmm. and two, they came because they were losing their children to a decade. They said a decadent culture in Holland. Can you imagine when you look at today mm -hmm. and, you, and you say a decadent culture in Holland in 1600s? Uh, the answer was yes. And the father said, we better, we better do something while we still have the strength to do it. That was their motivation to come. And when they came, as, a de as an indication, the Mayflower Compact, our first, dec our first document of law, laid out their idea. It's that they started out by saying, in the name of God, amen. Hmm. And then they said, having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. That, and then that's it. That was the pilgrims. And when they came, the first thing they did, they went down on their knees and they thanked God and their whole history was all about them in a right relationship to God, even thinking that when it didn't rain and their crops were bad, that it was because of their relationship to God had gotten off base and they got down and they repented. Everything was driven by the relationship to God and then how they acted. Well, the Puritans then came along about 10 years later. And uh, Governor John Winthrop then, uh, uh, stand, he started the, the, Ephes, the, 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 the colony then. But he, he called out in prayer to God at that point, Isaac, and he said that my God, is, he envisioned this new nation just starting, I mean, it wasn't even a nation at that point, as being a shining city on a hill from which this light would go across the, around the world. This light of what? The light of the gospel that the pilgrims had brought as missionaries to the Indians and raising their children in the fear of God. He came along as a governor and said, all right, shining city in the hill. Ronald Reagan picked up that comment, mm -hmm. we know, and made that even more popular. But then I go to William Penn. William Penn of 1692, right here in Pennsylvania, where we're sitting, um, laid down his frame of government, he called it in 1692, and he laid out the principles. Actually, Isaac, the principles we're gonna be elucidating here in these mm -hmm. programs actually were written down by William Penn, right from scripture. But William Penn, said, you know what, um, I could be a king in Pennsylvania, I don't want to be, I want to set up a, something here that the world would want, and he began what he said was a holy experiment that the whole world would want, wanted to see, and he said, if we lay down the principles of godly government, and who and how we are before God and who He is, then we will be able to perhaps enjoy a new nation under God. Mm. So, and then, and then, and then, the, then the, those who came after him built upon, built upon him, Isaac. But you know what? They knew, the point is, they knew who God was. They purposely entertained and cultivated a relationship with God vertically. They acted it out horizontally. So they started with the right place foundation. But I want to come back and ask you this because there are other passages in Scripture, and they were copying, they were copying Israel in the Old, is what they were doing. And, uh, and they made it very clear about that, but they knew that there was a difference, as we should today, that there's a difference in knowing about God and actually choosing 
Mm-hmm. To follow God, isn't there? Is there a verse there, a well, passage yeah, comes and, to mind? And you always um, refer, I shouldn't say always, but you often go to Joshua, in the book of Joshua, in different parts, but especially at the end there in Joshua 24, where Joshua says, look, you know, I've, I've, we've tried to do things the way that Moses taught us, but as, as for me and my house, what I have immediate control over, so mm-hmm. to speak, we will serve the Lord. And, and you see that the others seemed to follow him. It was after the dying off of that generation, then that things deteriorated. And so this, this is important, this idea of self-government. And this is one of the things I forget. So many times I look at, um, the, when I talk, talk about government, I'm thinking of our civil leaders, civil leadership, church government maybe. Um, but sometimes we forget about family government or self-government. A lot of times in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, it falls under the word self-control. And if we are controlling ourselves, it makes it a whole lot easier. Uh, if, if you, you know, when I used to teach uh, in public schools and things, if I have a room of well-behaved children, then I don't have to try to control the, the classroom. We can talk about what, what they want. But if every one of the kids wants to go and do their own thing instead of obeying the rules, it's very difficult. And, um, and so we need to have that, that decision. I will serve the Lord. And uh, the pilgrims, you know, that was something they did in Holland. They had liberty, you know, as nonconformists, they loved England, but they didn't have liberty. So they go to Holland and it was too much liberty and they were afraid. So they were teaching their children, but then the children would go around to other kids and learn all these wicked ways of the world. It was interesting um, being in uh, former communist countries preaching in Eastern Europe. They would say similar, similar things. Say, you know, we would rather have communism and persecution. Nothing on the grocery shelves, but people are packing the churches. Now there's all this stuff in the grocery store. People aren't, and they say, we don't know how to handle this freedom because it wasn't based on biblical morality. So our country was. Let's go back to 1776, our document of independence. How was that impacted by a biblical understanding of, of morality and... and um... Well, I, I, I'm glad you went there, Isaac, because, you know, in reality, the, the founders, the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, um, of which were Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and many others, Franklin and Jefferson uh, actually referred to William Penn as the founder, as the father of the founders, hmm. because he laid down these principles that we're going to be walking through in these next week. But I think there's no stronger way to look at the fact that those who brought to us this declaration and built upon the foundation of the Pilgrims and the Puritans and William Penn came to fruition um, in the birth date of our country on July 4th. Actually, it was July 2nd that the, that it was actually um, the, the motion was made to form the country, and then it was uh, then the document was completed, and it actually became July 4th, and we recognized July 4th. But this is the thing that really makes it remarkable to me. I think 56 signers, Isaac, 29 of them schooled in the Bible, hmm. average people. They weren't professional anything. There were some attorneys. There were pastors. There was a broad collection of people. One was a shoemaker, actually. Hmm. So they were, they were common from that perspective, but they were uncommon in that their view of God was unified. Mm-hmm. And um, th- our culture today has sought to eradicate all of this. And if we don't build it back in, that's what we're doing this for, because we need to reacquaint ourselves to what our founders knew. But here are just a couple of things. In the preamble of the, Consti- of the Declaration, do they not appeal to the Creator God and of nature and nature's God. The, the God who creates is the one who gives life. They knew. And that gives us life and liberty and the pursuit of uh, hap- happiness or private property. As, as they, all of those things I said, there is God. God created. God um, uh, established uh, the value of life and these certain basic things, happiness and private property. and. And uh, they also laid down in that section about the, the role of government, that governments are instituted among men, that they should protect these truths. They hold these truths to be so evident. Truths, integrity, independence, freedom, anchored in God. They knew it. They went there. Then they, then they delineated their grievances to the king. Hmm. 
so that the whole world, they said, so the whole world would know that what they were doing was not a spur of the moment thing, but it was a matter of saying, God has laid down how man should be and think and act and how government should work, and it's not happening. And to make it clear where they were, and they knew that except the Lord build the house, as you stated, that they labored in vain that built it, they appealed to the great judge of the universe in the last segment mm -hmm. of the declaration. And they said to hear the rectitude or the rightness or the purity of their intentions. And Isaac, that brings it right back. Mm -hmm. And from that day, then we now move to where we are. But our danger today in America is that we have forgotten who God is, we have forgotten our foundations, and the building is falling. And that's the reason for spending time on these as we walk through. But integrity is where it starts, the individual, and then it manifests itself into others, and then ultimately an entire nation. So with that, we'll come back and we'll close and wrap up this part one here in just a moment. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And today, as we've been looking at this idea of integrity, personal integrity, uh, the integrity of our national leaders, our church leaders, it's extremely important. It is literally, it is a foundational part of having God's blessing. And we talked about, uh, the psalmist talked about, uh, you know, the foundations. And, and uh, when we look at these, Sam, you brought us through the historically some of the foundations of our founding fathers we keep using this foundation kind of idea and and you know we see buildings collapse if the foundations aren't correct and uh, Jesus you know talks about the foundation on the sand the guy that builds on that versus a solid rock foundation and so um, we're you, you've been talking about William Penn the father of the founding fathers which I, I really like that uh, statement but um, in Pennsylvania, which is where we are, where you've worked in civil government as well as self-government and church government and family, you know, all these things. Um, but in, in, our in this commonwealth here, I remember uh, going before the Senate to, to lead them in prayer one time, and I looked at the, um, the coat of arms before I went, and it was very inspiring because the coat of arms actually has listed right there, it's right on the flag, uh, virtue, liberty, and independence. So can you maybe tie this together into what we're talking about for our foundations of our nation? Uh, Isaac, I can, and I think it's a, it's a great uh, point that you went to there, because this is how it ties together. Virtue is something that came out of the mouth of William Penn. But people, if they search around, they will, found it, they will find virtue written and engraved on many Capitol buildings. It's in Washington. It's on our coat of arms, and it's on other state coats of arms as well. Here's the definition of virtue. It says, nothing but voluntary obedience to the truth. Hmm. Virtue is nothing but voluntary obedience to the truth. And that's how it ties into integrity. And ladies and gentlemen, just we kind of wrap up this program right now. Um, Integrity is the first principle that our founders laid down as essential for a government. If a government that was going to be able to be free, a self-governing republic was the goal of our founders. If it was going to happen, they said it had to start with people of integrity, then move to a, nation, a government of integrity, led by people of integrity. All of that is relationship to God, who is truth, and then executed in their actions and attitudes to other people around us in the laws ultimately, which would be based on truth, that's virtue. But ultimately, a free republic, a nation given to liberty, and out of that freedom and independence, 
built on virtue. It's voluntary. Nobody can make you do anything. Voluntary obedience to truth. That is virtue. That's why it's first on our coat of arms in Pennsylvania and many places. And I'd like you to think about that as we get ready for in our next week's program where we focus on foundation principle two and three of integrity. That is going to be this. No nation rises without God's aid. That was first. Number two, needs a common unifying vision. We'll talk about that. And then thirdly, obedience to God's authority. And that ties in to virtue. These essential. Thanks for watching us today. Please back with us next week for part two as we continue in this series.